Welcome to OutDrive, folks. I'm your host, Cliff Callis, and each week I'm bringing you actionable marketing insights you can apply to reach, connect with, and convert rural American consumers. OutDrive is powered by Callis, a full-service advertising agency with a focus on marketing rural America. Callis offers a wide range of integrated marketing services, including website development, search engine marketing, social media, video, and digital. We develop strategic and creative campaigns to build your brand and your business. And you can learn more about us at ecalis.com. Now join me in the front seat as we head out on the road to success. Let's go. Hey folks, welcome to OutDrive. We've got another great story to share with you today about life and work in rural America. You know, each one of us has a unique blend of talents, educational background, interests, and experiences. It's one of the many things that makes our world great. So when you're running an organization, whether that be a business, a nonprofit, or maybe even an association, it's important to recognize your strengths and then surround yourself with people who have expertise in other areas. One place you can typically turn to is your industry association that can help support your operation with connections, education, and exposure to your business, products, and services. And that brings us to our guest today. Michael Eaton is the executive director of the Missouri Association of Manufacturers. Michael has an extensive background in marketing, design, and management in a variety of industries, and he utilizes his experience to help manufacturers in Missouri be more successful. Today, we're going to talk about the association he manages and what they do for their member manufacturers. We'll hear Michael's perspective on sales versus marketing and how God moments have helped shape his career. Welcome to OutDrive, Michael. Glad to be here. Thank you for the invite. Well, when we ran across you at a recent trade show, Darren Grover, a business developer here at the agency, said, you got to get this guy on your show. He's perfect. So I'm glad that you're here and glad you were interested. And I think we've got a lot of things to talk about. I mean, you've got an extensive marketing and, and art and business background going way back. Certainly the role you're you're in today where you're supporting manufacturers in Missouri and helping them be successful. We need to learn more about that. And, you know, you're a Midwesterner and, uh, you know, we're trying to attract people to the Midwest because we have such a great lifestyle here. So we want to talk about that some, but before we go down those roads, please tell our audience just a little bit about yourself. Sure. I jumped in the role of my current position right now as executive director for the Missouri Association of Manufacturers coming up on four years ago. And as I was sharing, it really feels like, okay, now, now my background and my life makes sense that God was preparing me for this role because of all the components and responsibilities that come with the role. So, you know, love, love, love what I do. But as my wife would point out, every job you've had, Mike, you've attacked with passion. And she's probably right. I love being excited about doing good things and, and good work and being intentional and, and sincere, authentic. Well, I think as I looked at your resume, it's diverse, and yet it seems like you're perfectly prepared for the role you're in. I mean, artist, marketer, you run your own business. You've got a lot of connections throughout the industry. What attracted you to this particular role, or is it just something that you sort of fell into? It is. I graduated college. I started in architecture and dear God, there was just way too much math. I liked the drawing component of it, creating creating something on a blank piece of paper. Uh, back when I was in school, it was, it was all hand drawing stuff. There wasn't as much of the computer aided design applications in place. Yes, I'm that old, but I love that process. Now then when they start introducing the math and the you know, all that, those components. Now, <laughs> now you're shifting from the right side of the brain to the left side of the brain. And, and I just ends up with a headache. But so I kind of shifted to an art degree, which really excited my, my parents. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I think moving into marketing from there was more a requirement of living, I guess, to be in all sincerity, who wouldn't want to just sit around and draw all day long, but you gotta, you gotta make a living and, and a paycheck. And so my first role was in in graphic design in a marketing department, knowing, I think, in the back of my mind at some point, somewhere down the line, I wanted to have my own, you know, 
marketing business. And again, I think that's the right side of the brain way of thinking. Let's eliminate some some structure and and ask why. Why wait a minute? Why do I have to be at work at eight? Why do I have to be here till five? Where is that rule written kind of a thing? And certainly marketing and and the right side of the brain thinking allows for the removal of some of those structures. Well, exactly. And you know, I I went through a similar process. I grew up in the retail business. My dad owned some retail stores. And after college, I came back and I started doing the advertising for our stores. And I really liked it. I, I liked the retail business in general. And I liked, you know, some of the things we got to do, travel and and merchandising and kind of a creative flair. And, you know, when I realized that, you know, I got to the point where I, I wanted to own my own business, you know, to your point, a marketing agency made a lot of sense. And so, you know, it's been a great career for me. And, you know, one of the things I like the most about marketing is it just keeps changing and you can't ever stop learning because if you do, you're going to get left behind. And of course, it's just, it. I think it's accelerating even faster and faster and faster now. And who knows where AI is going to take all this, but when did you first realize you had an interest in talent in art? Has it been your whole life? Yeah, I'd, I'd have to go back to my childhood just you know I, I i can recall times and and i have a twin brother and a sister 13 months younger so you know it wouldn't be unusual for obviously you have your built-in playmates you know growing up just within the house but when i think back in my childhood there was a lot of alone time drawing and building things with cardboard or paper and stuff that just really intrigued me. It, it confused my brother and my sister, certainly. So I, th I think that was always there. And I thought, how cool would it be to be a wildlife illustrator? As I got older, I was always attracted to animals and wildlife. And wow, let's see if we can merge merge that. So I always did that kind of on the side, just for my own passion and my own creative outlet. And later in my career, had the opportunity to really get it really involved in that in that world for a period of time. So, we'll talk a little bit about your marketing agency and you know maybe some of the clients that you worked with or things you enjoyed about it, projects that stand out in your mind. Yeah, you know, talking about the structure and stuff, I was always confused about. Wait a minute, a person gets up and they go to work and they come home and they're paid a salary and payday comes and it's this amount and that's it, you know, and, and the whole cycle of that. And, and if you were lucky, you got a three or 4% raise and which made a $2 difference in the paycheck, you know, and, and, and I just didn't understand that structure of, well, how do you, how do you grow? How do you expand on income? You know, I got married young and the pressures of, you know, paying the bills. My wife was still in school and, and found myself working three jobs just to make ends meet. And I thought this is ridiculous to go from a series of job to job to job and only be uh, be regulated with uh, how much that paycheck is going to be. And so I just want a little bit more control of my personal income. I think it was shortly after my mom passed away. And I had always shared with her my desire to to do my own thing. And she's like, she pulls out her checkbook and is like, okay, how much do you need to get started? She, I think, and I don't think I appreciated that at the time, but she wanted to to foster that desire in me. I think she saw just passion for life and living and, and I didn't take her up on that. So when she did pass away, I'm like, okay, you know, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this now. And my life has been a series of, of, true God moments. I had worked for a large ad agency. I wanted to understand that creative process, art to part kind of process, and then went to work for a small ad agency where I was the creative director and, and there was no, there was no other creatives, you know, and I wanted to understand the business side of it. Again, that's the left side of my brain. And I just get headaches when I have to transfer back and forth. But what I was seeing with a lot of design studios, they would eventually fail because of that left brain component being ignored. And so they weren't taking care of the business. And so I didn't want to make that mistake. And so I strategically took a job at a very small agency where I was involved in, in account services and uh, presentations and even the dollars, you know, the, the 
billable time and such. And then when my mom passed away, I thought, you know, this is time. When I was in Kansas City, I grew up in Kansas City and had done some freelance for an architecture firm working on Bass Pro Shops remodel back in the late 80s. And that was when it was just the one store and had the opportunity connected with Johnny Morris, the owner of Bass Pro Shops, and that team. You know, a few years later, I find myself in Springfield. My wife is is from down here. I grew up in a small town north of here and ran into Johnny and wait a minute, I didn't know you were down here. I didn't. And literally the next day, it's, I'm getting connected with some of his resort properties manager. And I think within a week, she's just like, well, I, I'm just ready to just say you're, you're our agency of record, you know, which those are music to, words that are music to our ears in, in our roles. And back then they, they use that term, you know, agency of record and for Big Cedar Lodge and got to be part of that development of Top of the Rock, the golf course down there, the Nature Center down down south of Branson. And it was just an incredible experience, incredible livelihood, raising children, working for myself. My kids got to see that work ethic, the positives and the negatives, you know, because there's it's a 24-7 thing when it's it when you're running the show. But certainly a blessing to be in that world, the outdoors everything that represents that Bass Pro represents that mindset and being exposed to some of those visionaries was just food for my soul. What a great client to propel you to the next level. To come out the gate with. Yes, absolutely. It was. Yeah. Yeah. Watching what Johnny Morris has done over the last 30 years is, is pretty much incredible. And, you know, his vision um, it's obvious vision, and, I, and I've never met the gentleman, unfortunately. Maybe I'll get the chance one of these days. But, you know, his vision to be able to create something is impressive. And it just it's just one thing after another. And everything is always at the highest level of quality. It's always brand consistent. It One thing reinforces another thing. And I keep being excited when he introduces something new and you know, I'm always on the lookout for what that is. I just think he's got the golden touch and and it's a gift. It's it's a gift from God. And I'm glad you mentioned the the God moments because I've had those throughout my career as well. And I think, you know, the kudos to you for for being open and listening, because a lot of times you, you hear it, but you don't really hear it. Yeah. <laughs> that that fear voice in your head dominates the let's go for it kind of attitude. Maybe I, I turn that channel off in my head. I don't know. I, was, I, I will say it, it It has been known to drive my wife crazy that I don't listen to that sometimes. But, you know, as at my point in life today, I wouldn't change a thing. The, the challenges, the struggles, uh, again, the God moments of the fact that that I got connected with the right company at the right time and got to come out big as when I went out on my own was incredible. You know, the the next opportunity that I had as I'm, and that was plenty of work. I was working night and day to keep that client and the various components of that client satisfied. You know, I run into a pharmaceutical rep and we get to talking and, and talk about the challenges and calling on doctors back then you, those reps met with the doctors and, and she was a little bit nervous because she had an appointment with the largest cardiologist in the state. And I believe she was out of Oklahoma. And she says, I get one appointment with this doctor each year. And called on him for two years now and, and get not nowhere with him. And I shared with her a perspective. And so you raise kids. They've all seen all the Disney movies, right? And I always look for the marketing message. So we've all seen The Lion King. Great movie, great animation, great story. And then Disney came out with Lion King one and a half. No, I do not recommend this video, this this movie. A, a lot of people probably don't even know it existed. But it's the story of The Lion King, but told from the Warthog's perspective. So... Same story, just told from a different perspective. My takeaway is sometimes we have to one and a half our approach. We have to tell the story from a different perspective. And, and so I always say, I'm going to have to one and a half this. And so I was sharing this with that pharmaceutical rep and I said, 
what do you do when you sit down with this doctor? And well, I quickly try to talk about our products. I'm like, fun. How's that working for you? Not to steal a line from Dr. Phil. <laughs> and I said, why don't you go in with a blank pad and say, what can I do to help you in your practice, in your business and see how that approach works? Cause you're not going to do any worse. And it was so incredible. She called me that afternoon. She's like, oh my God, it worked. I've already got a second appointment with him in three weeks. And I said, well, how did he react to that approach? And she's just like, he was a little bit perplexed. He was a little bit dumbfounded. <laughs> and he's like, well, if you're serious, I'm cutting on people's heart. I'm going in there and, and the, the lifeline is their heart, you know, and, and I'm doing, you know, intercut procedures on their heart and it's scary for them. I'm having a hard time explaining the process or the procedure to them. And if you could help me do that, communicate that, that'd be incredible. So being an illustrator, a self-proclaimed illustrator, I guess, I started doing medical illustrations on just the anatomy of the heart, different views of it, and then, you know, a, a valve replacement illustration. So I'm, I'm an illustrator, or I certainly wanted to be known as one. Adobe came out with Adobe Illustrator, you know, and back in those days, you could actually call Adobe and somebody would pick up. And, and I called them enough that they just like, hey, why don't you just be a beta test site for us and in expensive product, and they would ship it to me a year in advance of release. So I thought, well, there could be some changes on the illustration needed and I didn't want to redraw. So I, I started doing that in Illustrator and digital so that I can make modifications and in, in requ requested changes. So all I did was did five illustrations of the heart, went over to Kinko's at the day at, in that time and, and got color printouts, got them laminated, put them in a three ring easel binder and I sent it to her I walk in with that. And I said, here's your approach. If he likes it, say, fantastic. I hope this helps. I'll tell you what, I'd like to set up an appointment in three weeks. I'll have two new illustrations for your notebook. And I'd like to talk to you about our product. And she called me and says, it worked. I got a third appointment now. And so it was what, what I call a gain and maintain access tool. And so much so that the company headquarters got wind of this and they called and they were out of Kansas City at the time. And this is the same company that, you know, I think Cardizem for the heart, uh, Allegra allergies. So they're just like, we want to buy this concept from you and we want to take it into other, say, oncology and urology and women's health. And, and I'm like, dang, I got a lifelong client here. So, and so they were buying the rights to the illustrations and a heck of a lot more professional, certainly in the approach. And, and that opened a whole another set of doors. So I was medical illustrator, digital wildlife and stuff, traditional. So my soul was getting fed really well. Well, it sounds like it. Well, I think you, you had some great insight there. I, you know, it, it sounds like the example with the pharmaceutical rep was, you know, she was trying to sell what she had because that's what she had been trained to do. And you brought the marketing perspective of find out what they need. And then if you've got it, fill the need. Great, great example. That hasn't changed over time. No, it absolutely is not. Find out what the problem is. Find, find out what the need is and come with a solution. And that's something that doesn't matter what role you're in in life and in, in your career. If you can, if you can do that and then articulate it. And I think people just, there's, God, this is going to sound, sound bad. And I don't mean it this harshly, but they're so self-centered that they don't step out of their shoes and look at the situation from the other person's perspective. And sometimes we talk ourselves out of that perspective. Well, that's just me and I'm weird. So of course I'm going to have that perspective, but other people don't. Nope. I guarantee they do. You know, another marketing one-on-one right there. You've got to be able to get in the mind of whoever it is that you're trying to communicate with and see it from their perspective, because it's not what you think it's what they think. And, you know, asking good questions and listening, and responding accordingly is so critical. I think the a skill set that's transferable in whatever role you're in is understanding the other person. So whether you call that psychology, 
sociology, whatever, if you can quickly identify that personality on the other side of the table, whatever, then you know how to craft your your message and your approach. And you may have to one and a half that approach. Yeah, that's a great analogy, that one and a half. I had never heard that before. And I've never seen that movie. <laughs> <laughs> Trademark, Michael Eaton. <laughs> Let's segue over to your current role as the executive director for the Missouri Association of Manufacturers. You know, as I said early on, you know, I think your background is awesome for what it is that you're doing today. Talk a little bit about how you have used that expertise and experience to help this association and in turn your manufacturer members. Sure. Well, about seven years before I came to work here, I had actually, as a freelance job, designed their logo, which was full circle. I missed that messaging from God or whatever that uh, I'm laying the groundwork here for you, buddy. So we were in the midst of COVID. I was working in healthcare, but working remotely. Of course, everything fell apart and a lot of knee-jerk reactions were just eliminate the roles. So I found myself unemployed during that COVID thing and saw a job posting for a director of marketing with the association. And I'm like, okay, my background's been in healthcare marketing and manufacturing marketing. So the association has a health insurance program offering for strictly for the manufacturers of the state of Missouri. So it's governed by its own board. That's a C9. The association's a C6 governed by its own board. So having an understanding of both those markets certainly helped me very well. So I came on as the marketing director, not aware of the dynamics within the office. Unbeknownst to me, the board was looking to make some changes, a small team. So they met with all the employees individually. I came at it because I'd only been in my role for about four weeks, I came into that interview with the board from the perspective of where we, where I believed we should be. I couldn't talk about the past. I couldn't talk about that because I hadn't been here. I was talking about the vision and the direction. And, and I approached it from a very logical standpoint. I see the name, the Missouri Association of Manufacturers as a responsibility. I had discovered that we weren't really known outside of Southwest Missouri because it started out as a Springfield thing 30 years ago, went statewide in 2014, but really hadn't put much effort to go statewide. So I felt like there was a huge responsibility with that. And I talked to, that was my conversation. And they're just like, we just got a solution here. So I was able to jump into this role and I certainly would say that's totally a God thing. I'd always wanted to be in charge, I guess. And the structure was already in place from the previous two directors. And and I appreciate that their efforts for the association being where it was when I jumped in the role. But we had a lot of work to do for brand awareness and growth, membership growth all over the state. We'll talk a little bit about what you do for manufacturers. Yeah. So, and again, this is me. Don't think I wasn't asking myself that question on day one in this seat. And I realized we had to redefine what membership looked like. We were probably seen as a health insurance broker. And don't get me wrong, there's a decent revenue stream for the association that comes from that. And it would have been easy to sit back and just say, we'll, we'll live off that. But our membership numbers were really low not low in comparison to industry associations, membership numbers, uh, they tend to be between two and 300. But when I looked into how many manufacturers are there in the state, and at the time there were around 6,500. Well, that's a cliff. That's what you and I call a target rich environment, right? And again, this is one of those God moments. I knew I needed to get out there and get an education. I had worked in manufacturing from the marketing perspective, started with rival manufacturing, the crock pot people back. And I think we had five plants in Missouri uh, when I worked there. So, and I've worked in a couple other manufacturing operations. So, but that sh shifts and changes in the dynamics of what the manufacturing environment looks like. So what I started doing is just making some phone calls to stakeholders, some, some members and saying, Hey, 
I would love to come out and, and tour your facility, learn a little bit more about your business, what you make. And they were just like, heck yes. And I, I was probably caught off guard by the enthusiastic yes. And again, my intent and my intent even today still is getting an education, staying on top of what is the mindset of the owner of that manufacturing operation? What, what are their challenges day to day? So I say it started out as an education motivation for myself and realized it became an incredible tool, especially when you would start posting on social media about these tours, the reactions is like, when are you coming here? We'd love to be, I was getting invitations and I'm just like, oh, this is a real thing. And it is an incredible brand awareness and connection opportunity. And so over the last three years, one of, one of my manufacturers coined this phrase, or I, I'm going to go ahead and credit him. I'm going to steal it, by the way. <laughs> we, I think we've done a really good job of creating a culture of connection. I like it. And, and, and I'll leave it at that. A lot of associations focus on a legislative component. And we certainly, we spend plenty of time up in Jeff City. We have strong relationships from the governor and the lieutenant governor and everyone we meet with up there. But when out of those 6,400, 6,500 manufacturers in the state of Missouri alone, 75% are 25 employees or less. So 25 employees or less manufacturing operations make up the bulk of manufacturing landscape. But when you look at reports and you talk to the legislators, they're talking Boeing, they're talking GM level type manufacturing and, and realize that there wasn't a voice for the small manufacturer. There wasn't that reputation or that awareness for those small manufacturers down the dirt roads in rural communities. And I guarantee you, you drive down any dirt road, you will see a manufacturing operation. It, it always starts in the garage or in the, in the shop on the property and it grows to, you know, a location and you're talking three, four generations strong. There's rich history and by the way, Cliff, really cool things made right here in the state of Missouri that people just don't know about. It is amazing, isn't it? It's, I was just got back from St. Louis last night. So yesterday afternoon was my 205th manufacturing plant tour in three years, 205. You think, okay, at some point you've just seen it all. Every single plant tour I go on, I see something I'd never seen before else, ever, anywhere else. And and I'm thinking, wow, I mean, that's pretty amazing in, in and of itself. And it may be a process or the way they approach a, a challenge. But I ask myself, why is that? And I'm going to say, manufacturers are not people who stand around and admire the problem too long. They're the most critical thinkers, most creative problem solvers I have ever met, as well as the most passionate and proud people from a humble sense. So you mix all that together and great things are going to happen. They're not ones to tell about it. And so that's, a, again, another opportunity for the association is let's shine a spotlight on the cool things that are made right here in the state of Missouri. And, and I think manufacturers as a whole are starting to get comfortable with that spotlight. I love the phrase, a culture of connection. I think that is right on target. And I, as I was, as you've been talking, I was sitting here thinking, well, what kind of things do you do for the manufacturers? And you answered it without me even asking the question. <laughs> I thought that was great. You're, you're af actually seeing it from my perspective, because that's exactly what I want to hear. So we ran across you at the trade show, which was back in, was it February? Mm -hmm. About uh, four weeks ago. Yes. Yeah. And so tell us a little bit about that trade show, how long you've been doing it, how it came to be and what you try to accomplish with it. Sure. So knowing that we're the right platform to bring manufacturers together, whether that be a, just a regional manufacturers roundtable or a, a bigger event. So I started looking around and couldn't find a regional trade show and conference for manufacturers that related to, again, I'm going to go back to know your audience. Okay. Marketing 101, right? Know your audience. Our audience 
a majority of our audience is 25 employees or less. And, and people can't seem to wrap their head around that. And I say people, folks in Jeff City, okay? That, you know, they're, they're always looking at how does this affect Boeing or GM and how do we attract those type of manufacturing operations? I've talked to the folks at Boeing. They're a, a proud member of the association. And they say, look, Mike, we don't exist without the mom and pop shops. I forget. I want to say they work with 2,300 outsourced manufacturing operations, a majority of them in the state of Missouri. And when I say Boeing, I, I want to make this clear. It's Boeing, Missouri, because they haven't had a really good couple of months, but that's the commercial side. Um, Boeing, Missouri is Boeing Defense and very proud of what they do for our country and the world. And they don't get enough spotlight of, of that component because they shouldn't. They, they do like to fly under the radar, literally, as well as figuratively. So, but they but they proudly say, you know, we work with a couple thousand mom and pop shops. That's amazing. It really is. And so that's a strong voice opportunity for the association. And so just trying to create an event, an opportunity for them to get out again. Now I got to jump in their shoes. Okay. If I'm the business owner, okay. Of a 15 man job shop in name, any small town in Missouri, you're the guy who shows up at four o'clock in the morning, turns on the lights, turns on the machines, goes through the orders that have to ship today, make sure everything's in place for those shipments, check the voicemail to see who's calling in sick today. You clean the bathrooms, you make the coffee, HR issues, safety issues, compliance issues, and sometimes mom or counselor, because that's what you get when you work with people. You're, you're not going to travel to Orlando or Las Vegas or even Chicago for these manufacturing shows. And you, you can't afford to be out of the shop that long. And so I sat down with the team and I said, look, I want to establish a Midwest Manufacturers Trade Show and Conference. And they're like, well, what are you going to call it? I'm gonna, and I said, the Midwest Manufacturers Trade Show and Conference. And they're like, well, that's not sexy. And I'm like, yeah, but if we can own the Kleenex brand for the facial tissues, we're home free. You know, let's own that. And I think that first year we held it three years ago, we had tripled the attendance of anything the association had ever done. So I'm like, okay, this resonates. There's something here. We had, I think we had 70 exhibitors, which again, is double what they had had from an exhibitor standpoint. So that second year we said, let's go bigger, go home. And when I say bigger, go home, it's, it's when you're signing that venue contract, right? <laughs> Build it and they will come is not a strategy that sets comfortably in my gut because there's a financial commitment to that, but held that down in Branson. They got a great convention center down there. Again, we doubled our attendance. We had 123 exhibitors that second year. And then this past year, we broke 800 in attendance with 136 exhibitors. So certainly, I think we've connected a need. And so then the challenge is making sure we're bringing the conference sessions of value to our attendees. We try to create session tracks so that we can attract the various roles within the manufacturing operation. So we're hoping they're not sending just their HR manager, but they're sending their plant manager and stuff. And so content is very important. So yeah, that's that's how it got started and and, and what it is. Uh, we'll probably be heading back to Branson next year. I think the state of Missouri struggles with a large enough venue, you know, that's affordable. So and we do try to keep it affordable to our to our manufacturers. But we attract uh, folks Throughout the Midwest, I think our first sign up came out of California. Our second one came out of Florida. So coast to coast was the message received. And yeah, it's gone over well. Well, obviously, you're providing a valuable service or they wouldn't be supporting it that way. And not just the trade show, but your association. And, you know, I'm excited to see where you guys are, are heading. And so, you know, if, if I'm a manufacturer that's out listening today and they want to find out more information about the association, what's their call to action? Mamstrong.org, M-A-M strong.org. Our website's not, 
and this is this is going to be music to your ears. Our website's not going to win any design awards, but it's information and content heavy. I wanted to be seen as that first stop for information. We get calls every day of, hey, do you know a manufacturer can do this or, or help us here? Sometimes it's just process improvement. And that's what I love about manufacturers. They will support other manufacturers for the sake of manufacturing. That's simple. And so I love connecting, you know, a group in St. Louis with a group in Joplin who will never do business together, but they'll certainly share information and processes and how we overcome this challenge or whatever. So, but again, and I apologize, I get sidetracked with my answers. The, the quick answer would be mamstrong.org. We answer our phones, give us a call, whatever that needs to look like. Once again, culture of connection. Hey, Michael, I've really enjoyed visiting with you today. I think we could go on much further. I think we could talk all day, honestly, with our mutual interests. But as we close today, what else would you like to share with our OutDrive audience that you think they might find interesting or maybe even inspiring? Incredible work can be done anywhere. Okay, so rural Missouri is just a beautiful place, you know. And what I think has been shifting a lot is this this desire to leave home when we get out of high school or whatever, and I got to go to the big city too now. And maybe this is a repercussion of, of COVID or whatever, but this desire to be closely connected to the community I grew up in, and I'm happy about that. And then you add in the component that incredible things are created in those small communities, in those rural communities that nobody knows about. I mean, the reason the Hubble telescope is still taking pictures 30, 40 years after it was supposed to be dead, well, it's coming out of Joplin. You know, the battery cell company that made the batteries, and they jokingly say they brought Tom Hanks back to Earth. If you remember from the movie Apollo 13, it came down to that last bit of juice in that battery. And there are people in Joplin who don't know that's, oh, is that what they do over there? That's what they do over there. Down the dirt roads of the components that are part of outer space and some of the initiatives coming out of Boeing or whatever. So really cool things being made in rural Missouri that allows you to live and enjoy that lifestyle. Huge. A lot to be proud of. That's a great pitch for where we live and the lifestyle we enjoy. So thank you for doing that. And Michael, thank you for being on our podcast. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. Folks, thanks for listening to OutDrive. I hope you've enjoyed our visit today with Michael Eaton, Executive Director of the Missouri Association of Manufacturers. Come back again next week, and I'll take you down the roads of rural America, where it is heaven on earth. Thanks for taking a ride with us on OutDrive. This episode is complete, so head on over to eCallus.com for more insight. You can apply to help drive your business growth. And be sure to sign up for our free monthly e-letter, OutThink, for even more helpful content about marketing to rural America. Have a great day and keep on driving.